Okay, good evening, everyone. I am so beyond thankful that on a beautiful uh, Tuesday evening um, where we don't have, well, at least in the Grand Forks area, I should say, um, we don't have any um, rain or wind or craziness. We have a beautiful Tuesday night out there. And I am so thankful that we do indeed have so many folks with us this evening. Uh, I am very uh, thankful as well that we have um, the uh, very wonderful and wise and talented uh, Dr. Benson with us as well. And uh, it should be a great evening of training. Um, many of you um, have heard my spiel time and time again um, as you've been with us for a number of trainings. Um, but I will go ahead and kind of give you the spiel anyway. So uh, Amy Elke here from the Children and Family Services Training Center. I'm very, very thankful um, to have each and every one of you here with us this evening. Um, we're going to be spending the next about hour and a half um, covering a very um, important topic, by all means. Um, this is the first of a three-part series. And uh, with that being said, as we wrap up, we'll talk about kind of the next time I'm hoping that we can all pull together and, and be in the same room. Um, but uh, anyways, wanted to kind of run through kind of some some final details as before I pass it over to Dr. Stacey Benson. Um, this evening we will um, be providing um, continuing education credits. With that being said, those of you who are live here on um, the Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. on July 28th, uh, we will be offering face-to-face -face credits. Um, so what that, what that means is, is I will go ahead and turn um, all, of, all of the recipients who are present. I do have um, a list of attendees kind of who have registered as well as present. I ask for you to kind of look at what name you have associated um, with your uh, attendance or registration um, to make sure that if you are attending with a significant other, that their name is listed as well. Now, if you are struggling to find um, where you can rename yourself, not a problem. Just go ahead and, and um, type your own name and your significant other or your spouse's name in the chat box as well, and I'll make sure that you both get on that attendance list. Um, we will also be um, offering an evaluation as we've done in the past with that evaluation come at the end of that. There will be a downloadable certificate um, that you can go ahead and keep for your records. If you are a licensed foster parent, um, we do provide a verification list, um, like I mentioned, to all licensing agencies. So that would include um, our PATH, tribal entities, zones, um, youth works, LSS, that sort of thing. Whoever you're licensed with, we can go ahead and provide that verification sheet too. We are recording this evening, um, which is always a wonderful piece, um, twofold. So if we do have uh, fellow friends across the state where life is interrupting and they're not able to join us right now, um, they can go ahead uh, and view this um, information later on. As well as, you know, um, if you are a person that likes to scramble down a bunch of notes, um, it could be one of those things where, you know, you are welcome to go ahead and take those notes if you'd like, by all means. Or you could sit back and soak in the information the first time around and I randomly have had folks saying, hey, I attended the live, but can I still watch the recorded? Yes, you are more than welcome to. Um, so um, twofold, whether you're here or on the recorded version, um, we're hoping that you walk away this evening um, with some really valuable information. If you do uh, um, watch this presentation and kind of the recorded um, piece, we just ask that you connect with your licensing worker if you wanna receive um, kind of that hour and a half of credit. Okay, so those are kind of some, some simple details in regards to how you receive credit. Uh, last but not least here, we will talk a little bit about uh, the chat box. So a number of you have been with us in the past uh, for uh, past sessions that we've offered online, whether it was the Emergent FC webinar series or other series um, or other individual trainings. And so many of you know how to kind of work the chat box. I see the chat box completely lighting up um, with people who are saying, hey, I'm here, um, which I just love. Um, I love it when people say, hey, this is so-and-so here from wherever in North Dakota. It's fun to see that we have um, so many folks um, with us from kind of across the state. With that being said, I do ask um, that you post all comments, thoughts, questions right there in the chat box. Since we have so many folks joining us, um, right now I'm seeing 183 households, and some of those are individuals, some of those are, are two-parent households. Uh, with that being said, it's just sadly, like I, like I mentioned before, we can't um, open up um, 
the, the mics and cameras to really have a real good dialogue back and forth. But I know Dr. Benson is very much open to your uh, conversation with questions and thoughts, um, ideas that you have that way. Um, she very much wants to hear from you. So kind of how we'll do that is if you post that in the chat box, um, I will go ahead and um, either save the question for the end or I will, or I will kindly um, interrupt Dr. Benson as she's sharing her, her information. Um, so yes, so go ahead and type in the chat box. The other thing is, is if you do need a social work CEU certificate, I kind of forgot to mention that earlier, for the live session, um, please go ahead and um, type that in the chat box as well, or you are welcome to email me. So I'm not seeing any questions coming in about those things specifically, so we'll go ahead and, and move forward. And I promise we are close to done with, with my busyness here um, and to get us rolled over to Dr. Benson. Um, I kind of have this piece in here for us to pause because um, this evening's training, um, we, will, we will be covering um, what I consider more so a, a sensitive topic in North Dakota. Um, I think in any time we're talking about um, kiddos and sexuality, often some of us become pretty uncomfortable. Um, it becomes this really hard place going, ooh, I don't know if I wanna have that conversation, can I pass it off to anyone else, right? Um, and some of us are very comfortable with that conversation. But nonetheless, as we've talked about in the past, um, you know, when we cover topics like this, which sometimes can be considered, you know, one of those harder topics, um, sometimes it, it spurs on a number of things, right? It spurs on potentially the notion of um, some personal past pieces, right? Um, whether that was maybe the conversation that you had with a parental figure growing up um, of, Kind of what sexuality meant, what um, was appropriate not, um, however that would be, or maybe it's even something um, personally um, um, triggering kind of in regards to a past event in your life, or maybe a situation that helped, or that, that occurred, I'd rather say, um, with a child in your care. And when we, when we have all of those things going on, sometimes it can be kind of hard to hear some of this information. Um, and maybe not only this evening, maybe it would be in the next two evenings that we'll potentially be together um, as we walk through this three-part series. Um, what I would kind of encourage you to really do is um, be mindful of, of those feelings that, that these conversations may evoke. I really encourage folks, you know, if it's in regards to a child or children that have been in your care or are currently in your care, um, if things arise that, that um, just kind of resonate different with you or that you hang on to, I really encourage you to spend the time um, sitting down and talking with your, your child's case manager, or if it was a child that had been in your home that no longer is in your home and now you're hearing this information and it's stirring some things, um, to talk to your licensing worker or reconnect with that case manager that you, you did have that placement with, as well as um, if this does uh, trigger any pieces for you personally, I really encourage you to connect with those healthy supports in your life um, to, to walk through this. Um, like I said, this isn't necessarily um, always the easiest topic for us to, to walk through. So with that kind of little disclaimer, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass you, I'll stop sharing my screen here, uh, and we will go ahead and pass you over um, to Dr. Stacy Benson. Thank you. <clears throat> I think I'm, uh, am I unmuted now? I'm hoping. You, you are, and you, you can go ahead and you should be able to, to share your screen there. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let me, let me give this a try and see how, does that work? Wonderful. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Now, we are, test number one, wonderful. Yes, we were all officially ready to roll. So I, I will hand you off um, to be very talented, very wise. Um, you know, Dr. Stacy Benson is with um, Benson Psychological Services um, as a, a licensed psychologist and the CEO and president of Benson Psychological Services. So I'm just so thankful to have you here, uh, Dr. Benson. And um, I, will, I will kind of turn my own camera off and I will mute myself until we have some of those really good questions that I know we're going to have. Oh, I think we just lost your shared screen. Yep, I was just kind of going to go back and forth to that. Just okay, perfect. 
perfect uh, what live kind of so um wonderful thank you so much for that and thank you for covering kind of all the pieces in the beginning that i wanted to make sure and talk about so i really i really appreciate that especially the the part about the fact that we will be talking about some stuff that um might be difficult for some people to hear that might uh you know trigger something that has occurred in their life or with somebody that they love um and so please to to follow what amy said and, and take care of yourself and, and be kind to yourself if you need to to take a break from this conversation or to seek out supports afterwards um, so I am super excited to be here uh, and to be talking to you all, to you all about this. Um, I, you know, Amy talked about most of my history. Um, I've been a licensed psychologist for about 20 years. I've been working uh, in the field for about 30 years. Um, my original plan and my original life uh, goal and what I always set out was to work with children who had been abused. And very, very early in that, a series of events kind of changed that for me, including people changing my job after I had already accepted it and things like that. Um, and my job became working mostly with individuals who have offended. And so I still see myself as kind of doing the same work. Um, I'm just not putting out the fire. I'm trying to take away the match, right? And so I'm, I'm still see the work that I do as working with victims, even when I am working with those who have offended. Um, and over the years, uh, you know, I've learned a few things. I, I've probably evaluated well over a thousand um, offenders and, and treated probably close to a thousand offenders. And I've worked with hundreds of survivors and I've learned some stuff and I've made some mistakes and then I've learned some more stuff. Um, and so I'm hoping that, that some of that uh, will be helpful tonight and in the series to come to be able to pass on to all of you. Um, it's, it's somewhat ironic, you know, I also taught human sexuality at NDSU for about 20 years and um, the, the fact that my field has ended up working with educating people about sex and sexuality and sexual issues is, is very ironic um, because without going into too much personal self-disclosure, um, what I learned from my parents about um, the entire talk of masturbation, birth control, sex and sexuality, puberty, LBGT, QIA issues, all of that, all of that that I was taught from my parents can be summed up with the time that my mother handed me a maxi pad through the bathroom um, and told me sticky side goes down. Right. Um, now, in retrospect, that was really good information. You don't want to get that wrong. Um, but that was also the only conversation that I had. Um, and so it is very uh, important to me that part of this is teaching people to be comfortable with having those talks. How do you have those talks? Um, and how are you able to communicate with your children uh, and your foster children and those in your care so that if something happens, um, they feel comfortable being able to come to you? Uh, because the number one thing that taught that shows resiliency the number one thing that leads to positive outcomes for children who have been abused is how did the very first person they tell react um, that that is key um, to be loved to be supported to be believed to be protected those are things that have a ripple effect for many many years and probably generations as we think of how that impacts um, their own style of reacting and, and parenting. So um, I'm gonna switch and go to my slides and I, and I might go back and forth here a little bit. I, I do wanna kind of find that sweet spot between making sure that people have the opportunity to ask any questions that they have in the moment when it's most relevant and easiest for us to stop and have that conversation. I also wanna pay attention to time and I don't wanna to get to the point where, you know, the three part series turns into like a six part series. Uh, you know, I know that summer summer evenings are precious in North Dakota, and um, I want to make sure that we get through everything. And so I'm going to do my best to kind of balance um, answering the questions and having a discussion as much as we can, uh, with also making sure that I keep us on on time. So um, please don't feel like you have to, you know, hold your questions to the end. Please feel free to ask as they go. Um, but please also know that there might be times where I'm I'm moving things along a little bit. A little bit faster. So I'm going to go back 
to screen share. Um, uh, hopefully this is, is working here. I think if we go, um, the very first thing I want to say um, is to give special thanks to the, to the work of Tony Cavanaugh Johnson. Uh, I would say that she is probably the biggest expert in the field of what is normal, what is typical, what is concerning, what is problematic with child sexual behavior. Uh, she has good resources out through the Safer Society Press. She has good stuff on her website. Um, she is definitely an excellent source uh, to go to for additional information. You can also look at the very end and you'll have a copy you know, of this as well that will detail um, kind of all the different books and resources and stuff that I put together uh, in order to help me put this put this together. So I know afterwards, sometimes there's questions, oh, where do I go for good information? What sites are trustworthy? What sites are not? Um, this is certainly, you know, anything by her, I would recommend anything by ATSA, the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. Um, anything on their website, I think is also excellent work. So one of the big questions, one of the things you're going to be talking about is, you know, what's normal? Um, you know, for the most part, normal is just a setting on the dryer, right? We're all walking around with stuff. We might have different stuff, but we all have stuff. Uh, but some behavior is more typical than others, and some behavior is more cause for concern. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do is give you an idea of what behaviors might be pretty typical. Um, they don't necessarily have to cause red flags. They might just be, you know, a teachable moment to sit and have a conversation and what behaviors goes beyond that what are things that we really need to lean in or maybe get a professional or maybe even file a 960 on um, and to be able to differentiate that I, mean, I have it differentiated by age group um, but I think also it's important to keep in mind uh, you know cognitive status whether or not the child is neurotypical anything that might impact their ability to maybe not fall in that age range so um, if if a child has some developmental disabilities, what is normal and typical for them might be different than what is in the range that I have on the screen. Um, another thing that I think is really important to know is that sexual behavior in children is much more common than we tend to think it is. Um, and there's many reasons why it can happen. Um, and it does not automatically mean that the child is being sexually abused. And I think that any time that somebody that we love and care about, somebody in our care that we're responsible for exhibits behavior that might be problematic, um, that kind of protector mode kicks in and we want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence and handling this situation carefully um, and it can you know lead us to maybe think that this is more concerning than it is or that it might mean that there's more problems than it is so we're also going to talk a little bit a little bit about that um, so just to start some real important statistics. So, you know, up to 85% of children are going to engage in at least some sexual behavior before they're age 13. Um, and so some of this is going to be sexual behavior that's going to occur out in the open or that you're going to walk in on and you're going to see. Um, so we know that it's far more typical for a child to engage in some form of sexual behavior than it is for a child to not engage in any kind of sexual behavior. Um, we also know that uh, you know, kids are looking at pornography. Uh, first exposure to pornography is about age 12. Um, kids are having sex, kids are sexting, um, kids are you know, playing doctor, et cetera. You can see that some of the numbers we have up on the screen indicate that for the most part, um, it is not an atypical thing uh, for children to engage in sexual behavior. Um, this actually was a survey that they did of child welfare employees. These words are not my words, they're directly quoted from the studies. Um, but even individuals who ended up as mental health professionals had a high degree of engaging in some form of sexual behavior when they were younger. And as I said earlier, average age of uh, first exposure to sexually oriented R-rated films, pornography is about age 12. Uh, the United States is a little bit younger than Canada. 
but still pretty close. This slide I actually find really sad. 29% um, of boys and 1% of girls reported that pornography was the source that provided them with the most information about sex. And this, I think, is a really good um, reminder to be having those conversations, those age-appropriate conversations with children, um, because if they don't hear it from us, as we'll talk about later, they're going to hear it from somewhere else. And the messages that we teach and the values that we want to pass on might not be the values that are being passed on through pornography. Some more examples of kind of how common this is. This is related to sexting, sending and receiving pictures. So um, when children's sexual behaviors begin to raise a concern, we'll talk in general here in the beginning and then I'll break it down by age groups as we go through. Um, one of the things that you'll start to see that will raise a red flag for you is when the focus on sexuality exceeds the focus on other things. When they have more sexual knowledge than similar age children, or they're able to describe things that a, a typical child wouldn't know um, and that only a child who had seen certain things would know. Uh, I read a, a review uh, of an interview with a child who was abused by a woman and talked about the fact that I'll stop screen sharing here for us. Let me see. Um, here we go. Talked about the fact that when the woman was wearing clothes, her boobs were up here. And when she wasn't, her boobs were down here, right? Um, so we all kind of know what that means. And it might, if we don't, if we forget that we're talking about, you know, somebody clearly being abused can think that that's kind of funny and can understand what that means. But most children are not going to know that unless they've been exposed to something like that, right? And so sexual knowledge that kids have um, that suggests that they have more information than would be typical or than we would, re that we would expect that they would have. Um, we also expect that their sexual interests are, are going to balance. If they're curious about sex and sexuality, they're probably also curious about other things, right? As the kid that takes the toaster apart, or this is the kid that, you know, wants to learn about all sorts of different things, not just sex. And so when we talk about paying attention to how the kids react and paying attention to what happens, we're wanting to see if their reaction and, and the way that they view sex and sexuality is typical to kind of how they deal with things in other domains of their life, or if it's different, if, if they're more secretive in this area, you know, if they're um, more defensive in this area, if they tend to spend more time in that area. Okay. Other things that we're going to notice is that they have more of a compulsive interest, right? So, with sexual behavior that's more typical, um, it's easily interrupted. If you notice something, you correct it, <clears throat> you tell them to stop, um, they stop and they go do something else. Behavior that's more concerning, behavior that we want to pay attention to, is behavior that we have to keep correcting. We've already had these conversations. It started out as kind of a green light. Now it's into a yellow light because it keeps happening. Um, it's not responding to those typical conversations. And we know that when we have conversations about other things, um, we don't have to keep repeating it, but behavior changes. But related to some of the sex and sexuality, it's continuing to happen. Um, we'll also notice that um, this is becoming the preferred form of activity, right? So um, child might be masturbating, masturbating in private, all of that's appropriate. Um, but now they're doing that and they're doing it so much they don't want to go play with their friends or they don't want to do other things. So even a normal, typical behavior happening in a normal, typical private place can begin to be problematic if it if it grows to such a point that they are not engaging in other behavior in order to kind of solely focus on this behavior. Other things that we look for in general are when the child engages in sexual behavior with individuals who are either much older or much younger. 
typically typical sexual behavior occurs with roughly the same age um you know and often between kids who know themselves well so in general the wider the age range between children engaging in sexual behavior the greater the concern so if if the nine-year-old and the seven-year-old cousin are caught playing doctor that's one thing if the 10 year old and the five year old cousin are caught playing doctor, that's another thing. So the further we get apart from being similar age, the more that starts raising red flags. Um, the other thing that starts raising red flags is when these types of behaviors are happening with kids you don't know well, right? So kids make friends pretty easy. You know, you ever go to the park and boom, all of a sudden they're best friends with the, with the kid they just met. Um, but they might start engaging in some of this kind of behavior with those children then at the park or the new kid at daycare or somebody that is very new to them. Typical sexual behavior, more healthy, more normal sexual behavior is going to occur between people who know themselves well. Kids who play together all the time, uh, cousins, siblings, uh, folks where there's not this power differential and where there's much more familiarity. Another thing that you will notice that will raise concerns is when they begin to get um, defensive or what we call in, in you know, shrink terms, cognitive distortions or thinking errors. Um, they might blame the victim. Uh, she wants to touch me, see how she looks at me. Again, we want to look at how does that child react um, when we correct them for hitting somebody. Do they do the same thing? You know, he started it and you know, you are, you're always picking on me. Or is this somebody who takes correction well in other areas, but when it's related to sex and sexuality, we see very different responses. Um, also raises concern in general when they use sex to hurt others, when there's angry sexual language, sexual gestures, sexual touching, sexual threats. Um, and when they use distorted logic to try to justify their sexual actions, um, especially, you know, sometimes what adult offenders will do, for example, as part of the grooming process is they will have the child touch them first. Um, and that's, that's done for a reason because that then becomes a trick later um, because they can tell the child, don't you remember, you touched me first, right? But they manipulated that happening in order to be able to confuse the child. Um, and so when, when kids are using that kind of logic to justify their sexual actions um, and are not really able to understand things from the victim or the other partner's point of view, that's that's a sign for concern. Also, if we see things where they're using any kind of bribes or force, you know, we'll talk about this a lot more in the series on grooming, uh, but grooming is how uh, offenders and uh, we, I, we refer to adults as sex offenders and to youth as youth who have sexually offended, not youth offenders, and we'll talk about why. Um, but when those types of things happen, that's, that's how offenders kind of trick and create an environment where the child is easier to offend against. So things like older brother babysitting younger brother, um, I'll let you stay up as late as you want and I won't tell mom and dad, this is what I want you to do for me. Right? Typically, normal, healthy sexual behavior doesn't have strings attached and both people are wanting to engage in it. And so when you're seeing bribes, threats, force, um, secrets, you know, those kinds of things make us more concerned. Also, when we're pairing sexual concerns, uh, sexual behavior and anger, um, when those types of things come together, you know, typically um, when a man is very, very angry, um, it's hard for them to become sexually aroused, right? Uh, for some men, a very small minority of men, anger itself is sexually arousing, right? And so when we see that start in children and um, anger, maybe it isn't a turn on, but it's not a turn off, um, that begins to raise a red flag because 
you know, we, when we pair things together, and especially when we pair things with sex, because orgasm is a huge conditioner, um, they can begin as they get older and the more they get paired to really begin to skew the boundaries between um, healthy sexuality and, and non-consent sex. Okay. Another thing that raises concerns is if a child tries to manipulate children or adults into touching them. Um, and if you're hearing complaints from multiple sources, right? So if the daycare tells you once that they caught, you know, your son or daughter in the bathroom, you know, playing doctor with the other, some of the other kids and they're talking to all the kids, parents about it because it's been a problem, that's one thing. When you're at risk of getting kicked out of that daycare because it keeps happening um, and you also can't go to swimming lessons at the Y um, and it's been a long time since you've been able to find a babysitter, um, when, when you have multiple places that are kind of saying the same thing, that's something else that raises a red flag. Okay, so my son's going through driver's training right now, and so I have, um, my analogies are related to stop signs and that kind of stuff. Um, so we're gonna break it down in each age range, but when I talk about green light behavior, I'm talking about stuff that's age appropriate, non-abusive, doesn't require professional help, right? This is a teachable moment. Um, it might be something that sounds like this. Um, <clears throat> John, I know it feels good to masturbate. Masturbation is normal. That's a bedroom or bathroom behavior. Those are private behaviors. That can't be done, you know, even if you think you're home alone, that can't be done in the living room, those kinds of conversations. Yellow light behaviors are things that we're gonna monitor. We're not quite sure. It doesn't really cross the line into that red light behavior yet, but something's not quite right. It's gone a little far. It could just be a typical green light behavior that is not responding to correction, um, or it could be just all of these green light behaviors and they're all happening and that makes me a little bit concerned. Um, or maybe it's green light behavior for seven to nine year olds, but it's happening in my four to six year old. So yellow behavior is stuff that we're gonna monitor, we're gonna watch that a little bit more closely. Red light behavior, this is when we're gonna seek professional advice. Um, this is when we're going to uh, you know, make, make a report to authority, maybe file a 960. Uh, this is where something has happened that has clearly crossed the line and there needs to be intervention quickly um, in order to get the child who's engaged in the behavior help and services and in order to get the child who's been victimized help and services. So if, um, if the behaviors are the stoplights, then the parents are the rumble strips. So for those of you that <clears throat> have driven on more rural roads and, and know what a rumble strip is, um, if you've ever been driving and you've been driving for a long time and you're really tired and you start to drowse and you slip off the road a little bit and then all of a sudden brrr, you hit that, um, those strips in the side of the road that keep you from going in the ditch, those are rumble strips, right? And, and those are guide marks that tell you, oops, you have gone off, what's the appropriate path? And now you have to get back onto the appropriate path. And so that's what we are as parents, as foster parents, as other adult helpers in that child life. When they begin to veer off the road, we try to catch them in that green and yellow behavior before they get in the ditch, which would be the red behavior, right? And move them back into the line. So we wanna be able to teach them appropriate behavior. And to do that, we have to create an environment where they can talk to us. We have to create an environment where we're not afraid of these kinds of conversations um, and where they don't think they're gonna get in trouble if they talk about some of these things because the best way to make this kind of behavior go underground um, is to overreact to the point where they don't wanna tell you anything. Um, when that happens, then you don't know what's going on because the kids are, are afraid to talk about it. So in younger kids, um, behavior that's more typical is going to be exploratory. It's going to happen once, once in a while. It's going to be pretty clear that both kids are interested in this and both kids are okay with it. 
The kids are again of similar age and size, developmental level. Um, they might be siblings, cousins, or same age peers. Neither child seems really scared or angry or anxious about it. You might hear laughter coming in the other room, um, and you know the, the, nobody really seems to be uh, frightened about what's happening. And it can be controlled by increased adult supervision. Um, you have a talk about what's appropriate, what the expectations are, and the behavior stops. Uh, I think I, I think I might have went one too far. Okay. And this is a little bit different, not letting me go back, so I'm just going to do some of the rest of it from memory. So more problematic behavior is going to occur when it does not respond to direction, when it's between kids who um, don't know each other well, who, have, who are different intellectually, uh, where there's some sort of power differential, or some sort of force is being used. Um, and for where one of the child is maybe clearly saying stop, um, but that's not being heard, right? Um, you know, I evaluated somebody just the other day and my question was, you know, did they want to have sexual contact with you? And his response was probably not. And I said, well, what makes you say probably not? And he said, well, she said stop. And so my next question was, well, then why is that probably not? Right? Like, why isn't that just not? Um, and so when kids either don't know or don't care, right? So some kids, you might have some kids, maybe they're not neurotypical. They have a real problem reading body language. They're, they're not really sure, um, you know, what to say unless somebody is super clear about what their boundaries are. Um, and so they're not maybe intending to cross those boundaries, but they are because they don't they don't read that as stop. Um, and then you've got others who read it as stop and might not care and continue with that, with that behavior anyway. Um, children are gonna display sexuality different at all sorts of different ages. Um, in the preschool age, uh, you know, touching yourself in public and in private really common and it can be really embarrassing for parents when you know your three-year-old is sitting at the softball game and she's got her dress up and checking herself out right that's pretty typical um they're learning cause and effect touching themselves probably feels good and they're learning that and they haven't yet figured out um that this is an area that we touch in private um so they might rub themselves, they might rub themselves with their hands, they might rub themselves against other things. Um, this doesn't mean that somebody has showed them that this feels good, it just might mean that they figured it out. Um, you know, one way or another, they were sleeping, they rolled over onto a pillow, that felt good. Um, so they do more of it. So the fact that they're engaging in this kind of behavior, that's really, really typical. Wanting to be naked, super typical. Um, trying to touch moms or other people's breasts at this age is very normal. Asking questions about other people's bodies and bodily functions, um, and talking to children their own age about bodily functions, right? Talking about pooping, talking about peeing, um, you know, making kind of funny jokes about that. Very, very common. Playing doctor, talking about making babies, maybe repeating some of the things that they've seen. Um, you know, you might see it in their play um, where they've got Barbie dolls that are maybe kissing, they might have Barbie dolls that are having sex, Barbie dolls doing all sorts of stuff. Um, and you might even see the child actually put a finger or a small object, you know, slightly inside their genital opening if they're touching themselves and they figure out there's a hole there. Um, this again can be very typical um, and it's usually just a uh, you know one of those things where they learn pretty quickly that okay that that could hurt and I'm that I'm not going to continue doing. Um, kids these age often like to be nude. Um, they might show other people their genitals. They might be very interested in what happens in the bathroom and have lots of questions related to that. Um, again these sorts of things in that age group is all very normal. Okay, um, a lot of the same sort of stuff here, which is still very typical, very typical. Okay, 
when we start to get concerning, this is when they keep masturbating after they've been told to stop. They've been told this is bathroom or bedroom behavior and they keep doing it maybe when they're out in public or something like that. When they are being forceful with another child to engage in that same behavior, when they're acting out sexual play with dolls, humping a teddy bear, that kind of stuff, um, touching the private parts of an animal or an unfamiliar adult, following other children into the toilet or bathroom to look at their private parts. These are things that just make us lean in a little bit closer, right? So these aren't necessarily red flag behaviors, but these are things that we want to monitor a little bit more than some of the, the other behavior we've seen. Um, now, any time that goes to simulated or real intercourse, of course, or any coercion or force, um, persistently touching themselves, persistently using these words when we've been told that we have different words for what these are. Um, you know, maybe your family, you know, uses penis and he, you know, repeatedly uses dick and you have been very clear about what word you expect and what word you don't. Um, and they continue to use uh, the words that are, um, that they know are not acceptable within, within your family. This is a good opportunity as a quick aside um, to say, I think it's, it's really important with kids to be using proper and appropriate names for private parts. Um, there's all sorts of really cute things that people name their private parts. Um, they like, sound like Teletubbies, right? Like Dipsy, Lala, Pokey, whatever. Um, but I, I actually had a case where the child had been told that her private part was her cookie. Um, and she had to tell three people that grandpa licked her cookie before somebody took that seriously as abuse, right? When children don't have the language to communicate what's happening to them, um, you make it easier for the abuser to be able to get away with it. If children use the proper language, if they know what things are um, and they're able to, to discuss body parts using body part language, um, it's much easier uh, in order to be able to know if something inappropriate has happened. Um, and it just creates, you know, more of an appropriate environment that we're not, you know, naming this after cutesy stuff. Okay, I'm gonna go back to share screen. Um, again, where we get into problematic is anytime force is happening, right? So kid likes to be naked, runs around naked at home, gets out of the bathtub, thinks it's funny to run, run down the stairs and run through the house, really normal. Problematic, um, goes into the bathroom at daycare, comes out naked and runs around, right? Mm, you know, we've already talked to them about appropriate behavior. This is taking it one step further. Um, you know, the kid that crawls underneath the bathroom stall and wants to look at the other adult in there and then, you know, mom or dad is horrified and corrects them and they never do it again. That's one thing that can be pretty typical. Um, the child that keeps doing that, that doesn't respond to direction, um, that's much more concerning, right? That clearly does not understand boundaries and isn't listening when boundaries are being set. Um, when they're spending a lot of time in public now, they're touching themselves, they're not responding to, to that behavior. Um, when they're sneakily uh, trying to touch others, trying to forcibly undress people. Um, when they're asking strangers sexual questions after they've already got those answers from parents, where do babies come from? Perfectly appropriate question. You've explained that in a developmentally appropriate way and now they're asking the guy at Walmart. Right? This starts to be concerning. Why is sex and sexuality becoming so compulsive and so much on the mind of this child? Um, erections are perfectly normal, continuous, painful erections, something we want to look into. As children get a little bit older, um, we're going to see more interest uh, in sex and sexuality parts. I'll show you mine, you show me yours. They're going to ask more questions. Um, and really, it's important for us to answer those questions, but to answer them in a developmentally appropriate way. Your kids might ask you a very simple question, and you might only need to answer that question. Uh, when my daughter was six, we were shopping in Walmart, and the people in the aisle next to us um, were either 
what I would guess would be two young adults who were uh, furnishing their first college apartment or two young adults who were life partners, right? They were two young men and they were clearly uh, picking out things for their home together and acting very affectionate with each other. And my daughter turns to me and she asks, mom, sometimes do boys marry boys and girls marry girls, right? Um, and I was all ready to give her this response and talk about, you know, LBGTQIA affirmative advocacy and all this kind of stuff. And then I realized she's five, right? And what she had asked me was, sometimes do boys marry boys and girls marry girls? Um, and so my answer was yes. And her response was cool. And then there was no follow up. Right? And so that's all the discussion we had to have. Now at an older age, she's going to ask more questions. And then we're going to have further discussions on that. But when kids ask questions and you're uncomfortable with that, also remember that sometimes it's very simple answers that you have to give at the very young ages. Um, and that you can save the bigger questions for later. So. Again, at this early age, um, you know, we're going to see kids engaging in appropriate sexual behavior, touching themselves, um, you know, may having contact with peers, et cetera, in that way. When it starts to be concerning in this four to six year old um, is when they're wanting to play sexual games with much older or younger children. Uh, when they're continually wanting to touch other children's private parts, when, you know, you're getting together and you think they're going to play one game, but it's not just playing that game, it's always playing doctor, right? Once in a while you catch the kid playing doctor, really normal. Um, always playing doctor, that becomes more of a problem. When they're talking about sex and sexual acts a lot, when they're accessing pornography um, and you find them playing games that are more violent, or sexual video games, um, you know, if you, if you don't have or know about some of the parental controls that you can have on, on screen time and access that can tell you what your kids are accessing, I think those are also, you know, really important to, to consider. Um, again, uh, most of this has to do with it crosses the line when it begins to be repetitive, when it begins to be forceful, when it begins to be compulsive, um, and when it begins to be non-consensual. As they get a little older, okay, a lot of the stuff is still pretty typical. Um, at this point, we might start seeing that beginning access to R-rated films or pornography, viewing or listening to sexual content in the media. Um, all of a sudden, some of their musical choices are changing a little bit. Their games start being truth or dare uh, or things such as that. Um, they like to hear and tell dirty jokes. Uh, and you might hear them engage in other behaviors that they've seen, they've seen other people do. And they might tell dirty jokes, but they might not completely understand what they're telling at that age. Um, and again, it might just be happening more often. When we're concerned is any sexual behavior that's aggressive, coercive, intrusive, forceful, frequent, doesn't stop when it's told to. We're forcing other kids to play sexual games. We're touching other people when, um, when they're clearly saying they don't want consent and they're not getting that boundary being set. Age 10 to 12, uh, we are starting to see more um, interest in sex. We can start to see more puberty, locker room type behavior, uh, you know, comparing ourselves with our friends and talking about what things look like, uh, talking about what we think other people might look like when they're naked, um, beginning to experiment with more and more sexual behavior. Um, might be spending a lot more time masturbating. Um, you might find things around the house that suggest masturbation is happening, um, you know, in different places because you're seeing a lot of tissue or you're seeing a lot of lotion and things where they haven't been before. Um, them wanting more privacy, being reluctant to talk about sexual issues, beginning of having their sexual attraction. Um, and sexual intercourse is still fairly uncommon at this age, although we, we do see it. Um, we are seeing that, that kids are having sexual intercourse at this age. Um, okay. 
Concerning sexual behavior in this age group is a real preoccupation with masturbation, um, mutual masturbation, um, simulating foreplay or intercourse with peers with clothes on. Um, you hear, you know, a young girl talk about being afraid that she might be pregnant, which makes you think that they're either she doesn't have adequate knowledge about what it takes to be pregnant, or um, there might have been some sexual behavior that you weren't aware of. So peeping behavior is, is pretty normal still, uh, you know, wanting to look at somebody in the bathroom or wanting to look at somebody in the locker room. Um, but when you start seeing that behavior continue as they, as they get older and continue despite being talked about it, then we get more concerned. Um, taking nude sexual image of, the, of themselves, that's still a pretty common thing that happens among kids, um, but it's so easy for kids to be exploited with that and for them to be sending to an adult and think they're sending to a child. And so that's really an opportunity to have a teachable moment about what that means. Um, secret use about the internet, finding out they've been on pornography sites um, or they've been in certain chat rooms or downloaded certain materials that you didn't know. Um, there's an app you can get on your phone that looks like a calculator, looks like a regular calculator, and then you type in a password, which is a series of numbers, and it opens up all sorts of hidden apps, right? And so there are things that um, kids can do to be able to try to hide stuff away from parents and you know beginning to find out they're they're engaging in some of that type of behavior sexual behavior with children a lot younger um you know again you got a 12 year old and a three-year-old or 12 year old and a five-year-old and any behavior with threat force or aggression um and anytime we start hearing sexually explicit threats right it's no longer you show me yours and i'll show you mine it's you show me yours or I'm going to tell mom that, you know, you didn't mow the lawn like you were supposed to and I had to do it for you. Um, you know, giving somebody a wedgie is one thing. Uh, pulling down somebody's pants and trying to humiliate them or see their genitals is another thing. Right. Um, and beginning to, to have more um, degradation and humiliation in the use of sex and sexuality. So sex and sexuality is beginning to take on a different flavor. Um, it's, it's beginning to look uh, more harmful. Um, and the things that they are expecting in their partner are looking more and more adult like. So as we get into kind of that final launch, that 13 to 17, real typical to hear a lot of sexually explicit conversations with your peers. Now your teenage boys definitely going to be talking about the, you know, movie stars that they would like to have sex with, the teacher that they would like to have sex with, uh, um, you know, the other people in their friend group. Obscenities and sexual nor and sexual jokes are going to be really common. Sexual flirting can be real common. They're also going to get things at a different level. Um, you know, one of the things that my husband and I used to do when we played apples to apples with the kids is every now and then when the kids are real little and too little to get it, um, there might be a little joke that we would get that we would play in our card that the kids were kind of too young to get really what that was, but it made playing this game over and over and over kind of funny to us. Um, you start seeing those kinds of things happening more and more often with the kids and then the kids get old enough where they get what that is and yet you have to stop doing that. Um, you can see foreplay with mutually informed consent and peer-aged partners or you can see the full range of, of intercourse in this age group is pretty typical. Concerning sexual behaviors are, again, mutual masturbation with a group or a peer group. 13 to 17, that's not so typical anymore. You know, 7 to 9 maybe it is. 13 to 17, we start want to watching that a little bit closer. Um, sexual knowledge, again, that's kind of beyond what we would expect them to know, even when you put the context together with that. Talking about fear of pregnancy, seeking out pornography, um, and just kind of being more and more secretive about uh, 
about their sexual identity and stuff. You might also notice um, that teachers are starting to talk to you at parent-teacher conferences about sexual harassment, um, that they're starting to be concerned about, you know, some of the language, some of the drawings, um, and, and even if it's not sexual, if they start having some problematic and abusive sexual behaviors, you can also see that translate to other abusive behaviors. So let's say you've got a cisgender a uh, heterosexual 15 year old boy who's exhibiting some problematic abusive sexual behavior, you may also notice um, that not just related to sex, but the way that they talk about girls and the way that they talk about women is very different. Um, it's not in a mutual partner egalitarian way. Um, they're referring to women using uh, you know, slang words that you don't find appropriate. Um, they have different expectations about what women's purpose are, and it can go beyond just sex. But as they engage in more and more of these types of behaviors, you're beginning to see more um, just problematic worldviews about relationships in general. And, and you're also noticing that they're probably having difficult time having appropriate even friendship relationships with some of the appropriate kids that you would like them to be friends with because those kids really don't want to have anything to do with this guy um because enough's enough like we, we don't want to hear that anymore we want to go on you know to talking about whatever so I'm going to move into how do we respond um but before before I do that I just want to make sure that I, I have um had the opportunity in case anybody has any questions that have come up um, that I haven't seen yet or that you've been waiting for this point for. So I will move on on to how to respond to that. Um, but let's see if, if people have any questions about anything I've talked about so far. So one of the questions, uh, Dr. Benson, that has come in is, uh, do you have any groups or do you have any direct therapy for kids who have predatory behaviors? Do you offer any of that? Yeah, we do. So um, I can answer that question in two ways. Um, if it's sexually predatory behavior that has not resulted in legal charges, so if we're in the yellow area that we're kind of watching, or maybe we just stepped into some of the red behavior, but it hasn't resulted in legal charges, um, we do uh, have therapy for that at Benson Psychological Services, and we can provide um, you know some supports and some guidance and some parenting help on how to monitor and how to create safety plans um, and what kinds of things to look for. If it's crossed into abusive sexual behavior and the individual has been convicted, um, I have a nonprofit that's called STAND, um, and if the individual has been assessed at low risk, um, then we do have groups for that as well, and those groups go over uh, appropriate sexual behavior, um, you know, healthy boundaries. Um, they also can help you know, I think a lot of times one of the questions that comes up for parents if their child has engaged in, in sexually predatory behavior, they, they've got some kind of a child, okay, who do I need to tell? Does everybody need to tell? You know, can they go to Boy Scout sleepover camp? Can, um, you know, do I have to tell everybody at the school and the church? Or, or, you know, how do I navigate all of these new situations? And it's really, really hard to give anybody like a handbook and say, here's what you do, because it's so varied. It really is going to depend on that kid and the situation and the number of oversights that can be put in place. Um, and so that's one of the things that we can help with as well, is helping you navigate those situations that come up after the fact um, that that leave you with maybe more questions than answers. So. Wonderful. Okay, we have two more questions coming up. Well, actually three, and we just got another one. Um, so an individual asked, uh, can you talk quickly about how you evaluate um, normative versus problematic sexual behavior in kind of a neurotypical view? Sure. And so I think, um, I think the first thing, as, as I've said, that you're going to look for um, is, is it occurring within similar ages? Is it occurring in secret? Is it responding to redirection? Um, is it taking over more and more of their time? You know, are they, do they get caught engaging in sexual behavior and then you have a teachable moment and you have a talk with them and then the next time that child comes over, they're playing Fortnite, right? Or 
do you always have to monitor? Like, do you feel like I can't even go to the bathroom when my son has kids over because I have to be in the room? Like, once you are having to engage in a much higher level of monitoring, once you are getting multiple data points, the school's talking to you, the daycare's talking to you, other people are talking to you, once you begin to add kind of all of things up, you have a pattern. Um, one or two different types of behaviors, you know, that's going to be very, very typical. But as it continues um, and, and as it's happening in more and more places, those are when it's getting more and more concerning. Wonderful. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Uh, when is it considered problematic coaxing? So the example this person shared is, uh, is it, is it a green light if the child attempts to kiss their sibling a few times, the sibling says no, and after a few moments, the child stops asking and then just kind of moves on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the things, if, if you haven't seen um, uh, consent is like tea, please Google it. Mm -hmm. um, please make sure that you get the clean version because one version swears and it's not necessary to make it be fun. But there's a wonderful video that call, is called Consent is Like Tea and we show it to the juveniles here. Um, and it basically, in a nutshell, without reading the video for you, it talks about, um, you know, it, if you make somebody tea, they don't have to drink it. And you don't you know, it's not okay to force them to drink it. And if they say they want tea on Monday, it doesn't mean you can show up at their house and expect tea on Wednesday and say, but you wanted it on Tuesday. Um, and people who are unconscious don't want tea, you know? Um, and so that is kind of a way to explain, like, how do we very simplify consent, right? So if somebody's trying to kiss their sibling, they're saying, no, it's done in a joking, fun way. Um, the kid, you, you know, it doesn't look like they're trying to be mean. The, the siblings tend to get along well. Um, they're doing it easily in public with mom and dad watching and that doesn't seem to be a concern and they stop and they're redirected that's very green light yellow light is gonna be they keep doing it and the and the child who's trying to be kissed is now getting angry and you can tell they're like stop or you know you, you keep doing this i told you to stop and the other kid doesn't seem to care um you know remember that like even kids laughter and tickling but that doesn't always mean they like tickling right and so sometimes you're going to see some of that behavior that you might have to watch a little bit to, to make sure you know what it is red light is going to be where he's trying to to kiss his sibling he's maybe trying to touch her um he's not responding he's being more forceful he's maybe holding her um he's looking around to see if mom and dad are watching he's saying don't you dare tell you know i'm gonna i'm gonna take your teddy bear and hide it and if you tell you'll never get it back that kind of stuff that's kind of the evolution and progression from from green to red okay um, we have kind of another one just to clarify. You talked about, um, you know, to stand your nonprofit only work with low risk or high risk as well. So stand right now <clears throat> only works with low risk. We have a contract from the Department of Human Service Center. The, the human service centers um, are set up to work with the moderate or the high risk folks. Um, it may be something that, that stand does. I mean, that's certainly something that we've looked into. Um, but right now we only work with individuals who are low risk. Okay. And, and I should say also, because I know I saw people from all over, Stand has offices in Fargo, Bismarck, Jamestown, Dickinson, Devil's Lake, Grand Forks, and Minot. So we, we have offices all over the state. Wonderful. So very much accessible for most folks yeah. within a shorter distance of driving. Correct. Pretty much yeah. everywhere there's a human service center. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, how normal, like what color would it be considered um, for older teens to sneak in partners? Oh, okay. So for the most part, um, if the partners are age appropriate partners, that's probably fairly typical. Um, I, I, where we start seeing more problems would be, okay, those are those partners, um, are, are we sneaking them in and then we're sneaking them out? Are they staying overnight? Are they, um, you know, are they having sex in the home despite being told this is inappropriate? Um, are they older than we expect they're gonna be? Like, are they sneaking them in the house because it's after curfew and mom and dad aren't gonna let me? Or are they sneaking them in the house because I met him online um, and he's 21 and I'm 16 and I don't want mom and dad to know, right? So the, 
the purpose of sneaking them, sneaking in the house is one thing. Um, are they being invited in? Um, or, you know, was the window open and they thought it would be fun to come in um, would also be much more concern, even if it was a boyfriend, girlfriend situation with that. Um, and then it's how do they respond when you set the rules? Like when you say this is inappropriate, um, you've really violated my trust and uh, you know, we have certain expectations and this is what, this is what I expect from you. Um, are they embarrassed? Do they apologize? And does it not happen again? Right, I can still see that um, as being green moving into yellow, um, but if it continues happening, I definitely think that's yellow. And then I have to start wondering if some of that's going to move into red, because why are they sneaking in? Like, why does that have to be a secret? Um, if it's just about having sexual contact, like there's all sorts of places that they can do that. Um, so is it something about the fact that we're pulling something over on mom and dad that makes this, you know, especially exciting? Or is there something about um, this is somebody that mom or dad is not going to want me to have sexual contact with? And so they're sneaking in because I have to hide everything that we're doing. Okay. Um, we do have another question here um, asking, like, um, if a child in foster care uses the terms that their biological family uses pertaining to those, those sex organs or sex partners, um, but the foster family finds those terms unacceptable um, and the foster family has addressed, um, is, that, is that a yellow light behavior, would you consider? That's a tough one. How I, one of the ways to handle that on the, on the ops, onset is to kind of do for those of us that were around in, in uh, North Dakota when Sanford took over. And we remember that for a long time, it was Medicare Sanford. Medicare Sanford, Medicare Sanford. Now it's just Sanford, right? So if the child has a term for something, maybe they, excuse my language, maybe they say tits and you want breasts, right? Um, one of the ways to address that in the very beginning is you might use mo both, both terms, right? You might mm -hmm. respond to that by saying, tits is one word for it. In this family, we use breasts, right? And you, and you use both language and kind of move them in that direction. If, if they seem to be using that language because that's cultural, that's normative, that, that's what they've learned, um, and, and they don't seem to be doing it to kind of get a rise out of you, and it's kind of what they were taught, I, I think that's more just a factor of, you know, sometimes kids just need more repetition, um, and it's just about, you know, teaching them that there's different rules in different families. We want to be careful not to make it seem like what their family taught them was wrong, just that there's different rules in different families, and this family does this. You know, that this family puts ketchup on hot dogs other families put mustard on hot dogs right and there's just a different way of doing things um, and so it would be more getting into concerning behavior if the language is really derogatory um, and the language that they're using appears to be communicating more of a message right sometimes it's just different language um, but but sometimes the language can really be kind of a put down um, or mean something different and if they seem to be not just using another word for it but using it in such a way that it communicates more than just what that body part is that would be more concerning okay i have an easy one for you here um, okay. what what age does stand help is there an age range you know um I don't think we've had anybody younger than 10. That doesn't mean we wouldn't, but um, because they have to be convicted, to, you know, for the most part to come to stand, we haven't had anybody younger than that. Um, and I think the oldest guy in our program was in his 80s. So uh, we cover a wide variety of ages. Okay, wonderful. Um, I have one here about tween behavior. Okay. Kind of wondering what about those um, fetishistic behaviors and kind of that, that in between tween age that we all have fun with struggling. <laughs> right. Okay. Perfect. That's a great question. And it's a good one to end on as, as time. And then I'll move into the other area. So the fetishistic behavior, um, we, we have to be careful about that. It becomes really easy to view anything that seems kind of unusual, anything that might belong to like the kink community. We have a tendency to see that as more problematic than it is. So, you know, I usually tend to look at those things like, um, you know, for example, we've got, uh, we've got guys in our program that are into furries. 
right? Um, well, I don't know, are they into adult furries? Like, I'm okay with that, right? I mean, I'd rather have them into furries than into kids. Um, so if you've got a kid that's interested in a fetish type behavior, I'm not gonna ask you to, you know, foster it and support it and buy a bunch of different pornography related to it. But it's not, if it's not something that's hurting anybody, right? If it's something that can be done either alone or with a consensual partner, it might be that what you're seeing is the beginning of a pretty strong sexual interest. And we start to see fetishes start in um, the teenage years, right? Because, you know, maybe, maybe the shoe fetish starts because the best um, pornographic centerfold this guy has ever seen had on red shoes. And that's the one he masturbates to because that's the only one that he was able to hide and nobody's caught yet. And pretty soon he's masturbating to the shoes. Pretty soon the shoes themselves become exciting. And just like, you know, Pavlov's dogs that learned to salivate when they heard the bell because they knew food was coming. Um, if you pair the red shoes and orgasm enough, pretty soon the red shoes are sexy as, as themselves. So Fetishes can be problems because they can impact an abilities, impact an individual's ability to have and to form thoughtful, loving relationships because not every partner is going to be okay that your partner is into that. Um, but I'd really watch carefully about if the thing that they're interested in seems weird to you, um, but it's not hurting anybody. It's a fetish that they can engage in um, that's not illegal, that they don't need a partner for, um, and that is just something that it ain't your thing, but it's their thing. Um, I think that could still very much be green light behavior. Where it becomes yellow light and red light becomes if that behavior requires a partner and the partner has to be harmed to have it, or if that behavior is impacting their ability to have a positive relationship. You know, I had, I had one guy that I treated, um, you know, the very first session he, we had, I, you know, I asked why he was coming and he said, I dress in women's clothing, I feel bad about it and I want to stop. And so my question to him was, okay, um, do you want to stop feeling bad about it or do you want to stop dressing in women's clothing? Like, I want to understand what your goal is. And he thought about it for a little bit and he said, I want to stop feeling bad about it. And so we set up a, a treatment around that, right? Like, when does it start being a problem? When I'm, when I'm spending more money than I have, when I'm staying home instead of going out with other people. Um, if, if the behavior that, that they're engaging in is unique and different but not harmful, People are into all sorts of stuff, and, and I, I would be less concerned about that, certainly, um, than about anything that was, um, you know, with another partner that was harmful. So, okay, I'm going to move just for time here and go through some of these. You guys are great questions, wonderful questions. Um, so how to, how to respond. Um, one of the first things you want to do um, is really kind of calm, calm down, take a breath, you walk in and you see something and your first reaction is to, um, you know, maybe yell or, or, you know, say some words that you wish you hadn't have said. It's really important to take a moment to gather yourself. If you need to walk out of that room for a second, and, you know, take a couple deep breaths in the hallway and then walk back in, go for it because you are really role modeling something here that will be important. Don't overreact, don't underreact. Um, most kids are gonna stop that behavior if they're told the rules. They're mildly restricted, well supervised, and praised for positive behavior, right? So you wanna tell them to stop. Um, that does two things. It provides a message that this behavior is inappropriate and it gives you time to collect your thoughts and explore ways to respond. Um, one of the best things I think I learned from, from my mom in parenting was I hated it at the time because, you know, you never knew what was coming. Um, but it would always be, I'm going to need to think about what I'm going to do about this, right? And I didn't find out until I was much older that she didn't know what she was going to do about that truly, and she needed time to think about it. Um, but you don't have to have a response right away. And sometimes the immediate responses that we have um, are not always the best responses. And sometimes we make threats that we're never going to follow through with, like, um, you know, even not related to something like this. Like, if you don't stop, I'm going to leave this store right now and you're going to walk home. 
Well, bullshit. You're not going to walk home. The kid knows that. Um, so when you do that, you just communicate to the kid that what you say, I don't have to listen to because the rules are inconsistent and, um, and you're not going to follow through with them. And so you want to be really careful that you respond and you say what it is that you mean to say after having a time to really thoughtfully gather yourself. So step away, take a few minutes, figure it out, take a deep breath, count to 10, um, separate the kids. You know, you can talk to the kids separately about what just happened. Think about stop, stop, relax, calm down, think, observe, plan. What am I going to do? What did I just walk in on? This moment is important. How I handle this is important. It's okay for me to take a little bit of time to figure out what I'm going to do. Um, and we're going to talk about <clears throat> a couple of things. When I talk about here to find out what happened, um, if you don't have a lot of information, this assumes right here that you did not walk in on a red light behavior. And we will talk in a minute about what happens when you walk in on a red light behavior because you handle that very differently. This is when you walk in on like a yellow light behavior or maybe even a green light behavior and it's normative, but you want to set some rules around it. You want to ask open-ended questions so they can tell you what happened in your own words. Um, you know, what were you doing? How did you get that idea? How did you, how did you learn that? What did you feel about doing it? Um, you don't want to ask the questions over and over. I know when I was growing up, the only time my mom asked me the same question more than once is when she thought I was lying. You know, did you, did you take that cookie? No. Did you take that cookie? No. Did you take that cookie? Yes. Um, and so children are primed if they're asked the same question over and over to know that that must mean that I'm not giving the right answer, right? And so sometimes it doesn't mean that they're suddenly honest the third or fourth time you ask them. Sometimes it means that they've learned, I guess I'm supposed to change my answer because this isn't the right answer. And kids really want to please and they may change their responses, right? So we want to be real careful. Again, this is if you walk in on a yellow um, behavior or even a green light behavior that you want to that you want to address. So you want to gather enough information to help you figure out what's appropriate. How do I need to respond to this? Who all is involved? What other parents do I need to let know? Um, what kind of safety mechanisms do I need to set in place for that? Um, you want to reinforce the privacy rules. Uh, go over those again. Remember, no touching others' private parts. That's a rule in this house. Um, you want to set a consequence. Um, you want to provide it in a very immediate, firm, and calm manner, uh, which might be an immediate means in the conversation where you have chosen to to have that, um, you know, because you tried to touch Tommy's parts, I'm sorry, Tommy has to go home and you can't play with him for the rest of the week. I need to know Tommy's safe in her home, right? That might be a consequence. Um, after the consequence, you want to help them things of alternatives, right? We want to make sure that we're not just teaching kids what not to do because they might not be sophisticated enough to know what to do, right? So all of these no's, they might, okay, maybe they don't touch Tommy in the private part next time, but maybe they touch Susie in the private part because you didn't say I couldn't touch Susie. Um, so you want to be able to tell them also what alternatives to do. Um, and teach them, you know, something else to do if they're in an uncomfortable situation. Maybe they were the recipient of that. You teach sovereignty over your own body. Um, you know, another th another thing I'll, I'll say super quick, I, I got about five minutes here, is, um, you know, one of the things that, that we sometimes do as parents um, is we undo things that we want to teach our child, right? So when my daughter was six, um, we're a very huggy family. It takes an hour to leave because everybody's got to hug everybody and then everybody's got to hug everybody again. It's typical North Dakota, Minnesota family, right? Um, and my daughter didn't want to hug Uncle Ken, right? Uncle Ken's a big guy, nice guy. Uncle Ken's not a pedophile, but my daughter didn't want to hug him. And my mom said, oh, give Uncle Ken a hug. You're hurting his feelings, right? Absolutely not. You know, Mama Bear kicked in because my daughter had set a boundary she had decided that her body was her right to say who touched it and who didn't touch it. And she had decided that this person did not fall in the category of somebody that could touch it. Um, and so that's important. And Uncle Ken, bless his heart, um, leaned down and said, would you shake my hand? And asked permission and taught my daughter that adults 
can ask permission of children and that it's okay for children to respond in that way, right? And so you want to teach your, your children that it's okay to set these boundaries. How do we set these boundaries? We want to be careful when we send them off and we say, listen to what your teacher says, do whatever they say. We don't necessarily want them to do whatever they say, right? I mean, there's some teachers that take advantage of those types of conversations. So we want to make sure that we teach our children that they have a right to say no, that they're in charge of who touches their body, um, and we give them the skills to be able to navigate some of these situations that can be more difficult for them. Now, I'm going to go super quick because this is one of the most important things that I want to make sure you all hear. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead to this, and I'm going to assume now that you have walked in on a red light behavior, okay? Um, you are their parent. You are their foster parent. You're not the detective. Thank God you're their parent, because what they need right now is somebody to love and support them and keep them safe. Um, but do not, please, if you remember nothing else from this um, talk, do not try to investigate what happened if you walk in on a red light behavior. Do not try to gather more data. Leave that to the professionals. Any conversation prior to an appropriate further investigation that is taped and takes place with the appropriate people, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how well-meaning, has the potential to contaminate that child's recollection. Um, and that includes therapists. Therapists are not trained forensic interviewers. And some Therapists don't know that, right? And some therapists will say, yes, I will see Johnny and let you know if I think Johnny's been abused. That's inappropriate use of therapy. Memories are not like videos. They're like Wikipedia ages. They, Wikipedia pages, they can be edited um, and they can be edited by other people. Don't risk making the case not prosecutable where the child statements can be called into question because you keep asking and maybe they're not answering your question. So you bring in uncle or you bring in Aunt Susie because they get along great with Aunt Susie and maybe they'll answer her. And now all of a sudden we've got a child who's been asked by multiple people, multiple different things, maybe with leading questions. Did he touch you? It's okay if he touched you. You can tell me. These things, if they happen before the proper authorities have come into place, can be really, really damaging. Your role um, is to tell the child that you love them, to tell the child that there are special helpers um, that are going to get involved with this to make sure that they are safe, um, and that you want to make sure that they feel safe and that they feel protected, and that you are ready to listen as much as they want to talk. Um, but the first conversation happens with special helpers, and the next conversation happens with us. Um, that's a super important piece. So we have just a couple of minutes, and so I'm I'm going to um, see if there's any wrap-up questions before we are done here. Um, I think we had just a little bit left, but not too bad. So um, any other questions related to how to respond or anything else that you can think of? So we did have a question come in um, asking if you work differently or kind of um, address differently. You know, teenagers who have some developmental delays and they're exhibiting some of those same concerning behaviors. Do you have to address that differently? Yeah, yeah, absolutely you do. So um, <clears throat> children who have developmental, dis developmental disabilities and delays, um, often what we do is we maybe simplify it down to three or four special phrases that we, that we teach them that might be appropriate. It's a lot of repetition. Sessions might be more often, but they might be shorter. So if we have the opportunity where we can do Zoom sessions where it's not so impactful on a schedule, it might be better to do two sessions for a half an hour than one session for an hour. Um, and we want to make sure and give the same information kind of over and over. And you want to use simpler words to be able to explain that. And a lot of times kids with developmental disabilities also really want to please, and they might pretend that they understand when they don't. Um, and they might smile and they might nod and they might make it seem like they get it. And so you want not only for them to repeat it back to you, um, but for them to repeat it back to you into a different context, right? So you might say something like um it's not you know it's not okay to touch people unless you ask permission that might be a simple statement what does and, and then you'll say what did i say it's not okay to touch people until you ask permission what does that mean you know okay and, and so you have them put it back to you 
in a different context so you can tell that they can manipulate that so they're not just learning words but they're learning the behaviors that are associated with the words that makes sense it does i don't know if folks have any last questions i think we hit everyone that was listening in the chat um i'm not seeing any other ones and i'm hoping i didn't miss anyone um so i'm not seeing any other questions come in Awesome. I think really the, the things that, that I didn't get to are on uh, the handout that you can have, which are basically kind of what to teach and when. So when do you teach these things? Like one of the things that I did, for example, with my son is we would go to West Acres and we would sit in the food court. And I would say, I want you to imagine that you and I got separated. You lost mom. Look around and tell me, who do you go to for help? And then I want to know why, right? And I mean no disrespect to this when I say I did not teach my kids to look for a policeman. I taught my kids to look for a mommy, right? Because number one, we don't see policemen in the community as much as we see mommies. Number two, kids can't tell the difference between policemen and security guards. And sometimes it's, a, it's one of the most preferred um, professions of serial killers because they want to be cops, but they can't pass the psychological, right? So sometimes there might be individuals in that procession who are super good guys, and sometimes there might not. Um, but I, I think that if they go to a dad, chances are if a lost kid comes up to a dad, what that dad is going to do is he's going to comfort that child, and he's going to take that child to an authority figure, right? He'll walk that child, you know, carefully and gently down to the office, <clears throat> and he will find the store manager um, <clears throat> and they will take over and they will say, thank you very much. We will call whoever. And then dad has discharged his duty and he's done everything we want dad to do. Um, but a mom, you know, a mom is going to do all that. And then she's going to sit and she's probably going to stay with that lost kid. And she's probably got snacks in her purse. Right. Um, and she's probably going to shepherd that process a little bit more and so I, I taught my mom i taught my kids go you know find a mommy if you get lost um i also taught my kids if somebody's trying to take you um don't yell no right if you're at chuck e cheese and you see a three-year-old being hauled out at chuck e cheese and he's kicking and screaming and saying no your thought is oh you know this kid doesn't want to go home i taught my kids to to say this is not my dad Right? This is a stranger. In a way, that didn't scare them. I don't want to sound like that, but, but that has a very different thing, right? And so what we teach our children can really help keep them safe. Um, and I'm thinking to myself now, please, 99.9% .9 of security guards are really good, wonderful people who went into that job because they want to help support and protect people. Um, so I'm realizing now I didn't mean to make the serial killer comment. Um, but anyway, um, so most of the time, um, what we teach our children is we can provide them with opportunities where they have the skills to be able to navigate some of these difficult situations early on, right? You know, you have your kid, um, go ask somebody where the bathroom is so you can watch and see how do they ask and how close do they stand, etc. So the stuff that we didn't get to goes over what to teach kids at different ages, how to teach them that, and what sort of things to expect from kids before they might be ready to move on to the next level. Um, so we weren't able to talk about that, but there'll be really detailed slides that you'll be able to go through. Um, and, the, and the last thing I'll say is the, the book that I recommend is called Protecting the Gift. Uh, it's a book by Gavin DeBecker. Gavin DeBecker is an individual who went on to be a huge, um, run a huge security uh, program and um, he was hired by world leaders and celebrities, et cetera, on how to keep people safe. Um, and he wrote a book for parents about how to protect your children. Um, and it's an excellent book. So I'll, I'll end with that plug. So, and that's, if nobody has any other questions, that's all I have. I, I literally am only seeing uh, praises coming in and the appreciation. <laughs> Um, talk about a ton of information right in the last hour and a half um, by all means um, I know someone saying the name of the book again um, protecting the gift yes and, and you know book. oh go ahead dr. Benson mm -hmm. go ahead There's sorry a book called the gift of fear 
which you would read for yourself. And then there's the book called Protecting the Gift, which you would read um, to learn how to protect your children. Same author. Wonderful. I, I will try to include the name of both of those books as well as, uh, you know, the name of the video, um, the, the TV video. I know I wrote down the name um, and I'm blanking on it right now, uh, but I will, I will include that um, in uh, the email as well as a copy of the PowerPoint. So all of that piece, all of those pieces of information, um, we will share it within the email that I'm hoping to get out right away tomorrow morning. That's my plan um, with the evaluation. So I know a number of you commented for CEU. Um, social work certificates. Um, we will have two additional sessions. So thankfully, if you do have more questions, we will have Dr. Benson with us for two additional nights. Um, one would be uh, two weeks from tonight, August 11th. Um, and that would be uh, the one where uh, the title is something like, uh, but he seemed like such a nice guy, um, how sex offenders use grooming um, to gain kind of access to children, um, trick parents, discourage reporting that sort of thing. And then um, we're going to change things up a little bit. We're going to go three weeks in between um, for that September 1st date. Um, and that would be my foster child is offended. Um, what do I do now? How to provide support, accountability, and safety um, for others. So um, lots of good information to come. Um, if you didn't catch it all, I know a couple of you were commenting on your feverishly writing notes. Um, go ahead and you can listen to this again. I hope to have it up on our website by the end of the week. Um, and if you have other questions, be sure to let me know and I can try to get those to Dr. Benson that maybe we can sneak those in in the next two um, gatherings uh, and uh, we'll go from there. So I'm not seeing any other questions coming in and we are pretty much right on spot at the 830 hour. So kind Perfect. of impressive <laughs> that way. Thank you again for having me. Everybody asked really good questions. I hope that it was helpful and I really look forward to seeing everybody again in two weeks. Perfect. I will send out registration for that by the end of this week as well. Um, so just because you're with us tonight, you do have to re-register for those other um, two sessions separately. So watch for those emails as well as um, kind of the plug on Facebook, um, that sort of thing. And uh, with that, I sincerely thank all of you for sharing your beautiful Tuesday night with us. Um, it's hopefully still nice out in your neck of the woods. You can maybe sneak outside for a moment and get some fresh air. Um, before you head to bed. So thank you again, Dr. Benson, for sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, with that, I think we will wish everyone a great rest of your night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.